I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Duel of the Nile, released in 1985, directed by Louis Teague. Starring Michael Douglas, Kathleen Turner, Danny DeVito, Spyros Focus, Focus, Focus. Spyro, Spyros Focus, Focus, Focus. You pronounce the S in Spyros? Spyros? Spyros Focus, can't say that name. This guy, bit of a legend outside of this movie. And, and I can't read my own writing, Mr. Eisenberg. Production cost of 25 million, which is not evident, I might add. Domestic take of 75 million, a international take of 20 million, for a worldwide total of 96 million. Giving them profit of 71 million, Less or marketing and associated, how did they manage to make a profit? What was with the 80s? Characters. Well, if you've seen the first movie, you've already met the characters. Which is a shame because there's only one of them worth watching. You've got a new villain who is much like the previous villain, only this villain gets lines. A walking, talking plot device that is actually one of the more redeemable characters in this film. And about a thousand other support characters, some of which are, you know, actually worth it. Look, if I sound cross about this already, it's because I just feel like I wasted two hours of my life, okay? But to actually break down the characters properly, look, they are rinse repeat of last time round. DeVito's character, Ralph, Ralphie gets a fair bit more to do this time. He's got a fair few more lines. He's got a fair bit more to do with the storyline up until a point, And then he's sidelined with the rest of the other side characters. Yeah, and yeah, he's comic relief again, a little bit of action. Although him slapping into the side of a tunnel is funny. Um, I think mainly because not much else was. What else can I say about this train wreck? Jack and Jonah back, much like last time, just less charisma. You kind of got the feeling that they were there because they had to be there. This movie has contractual obligation all over it. You could have used it for a subheading. The villain's interesting to begin with. He feels very staged. He feels very, very forced. Um, eventually, the only thing that's good about him is when he's getting frustrated or annoyed. Then it's fun watching him get cranky and cross about the fact that nothing's working. Uh, <laughs> isn't too bad. I was kind of identifying with him at that point. And then you've got this character played by Mr. Eisenberg. He is, well, the plot device. He's what everyone's chasing. I know, he was fun enough. I kind of enjoyed him. He was a welcome distraction to the film. I kind of feel like he should have been the focus, not the side sub story attached to the main plot. Oh, and the tribesmen. They were kind of cool. Ooh. That was almost bad. That's about all I got for the characters. They're honestly just retreads and nothing terribly interesting. As for score... Nah, nah, they're just gonna get a two. The glimpses of good were just overshadowed by the dull porridge of bleh. Story. Story felt very cobbled together. It's, it's a fairly standard cliche adventure in the desert sort of thing. Except it never really sticks to any of the, well, stereotypes or cliches close enough or well enough for you to actually connect or identify to the movie. It's it's a th hard thing to understand. It felt incomplete. There we go. It felt incomplete. The story felt incomplete. It had all the components and parts, but just the, all the connecting bits just didn't seem to make any sense. It's definitely got all your cliche desert tropes and elements. And it's also got your romance aspect, which it needed to have because the last one was a romantic, romantic comedy adventure. And this is meant to be the romantic comedy adventure. Just a little less comedy and a lot less romance. I mean, they've already done it. You know, they, they inject some strife and tribulation into the relationship. You know, she doesn't feel fulfilled. He doesn't feel appreciated. Fair bit of miscommunication. But they're on again, off again, so often it's like a light switch. By the third time it happens, you don't care. You already know they're going to make up at the end. It's all going to be happily ever after. Stop trying to drag it out and convince us there's going to be something else. Real quickly, Joan is convinced to travel to some made-up African country to write about some leader who's going to take over and unite on the entire Arab nations. Turns out he's an evil dictator who's there to oppress people. All plans for war and stuff. He's captured the local holy man, the jewel of the Nile. Then it's a chase through the desert as they're trying to get the holy man to the holy city. Holy tent city? More of an open air stadium, really? Which ends up just being a kind of a concert? I don't know, it didn't make much sense. Either way, they've got to get him there so he can denounce the bad guy so the bad guy doesn't take over all of the localized area or something. There's a lot of focus on the in-between bits and then right in the middle they decide to really zone in on the romance and make sure that everyone knows that these two are going to be okay. This huge sequence in the middle with the Numidian, 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 
African tribe, these guys. Big sequence in there, which is very, very 80s African tribal scenario. Wow. Anyway, it plays out as some big feel-good romantic moment, which it almost manages to be. Except they pull it apart in the very next scene where they decide that it's not going to work. After wasting 15 to 20 minutes of our time, they've decided they're on the rocks again. It's at that point that I didn't care anymore about their relationship. Whatever. You just want someone to make up the damn mind, really. Ralph manages to accidentally save the day, fight the bad guy, bad guy's dead, the holy man comes out and calms the crowd, and everyone has a nice moment. Oh yeah, they get married at the end. But not that anyone cared by this point. As for score, look, I'm afraid it's one of those stories that where all the good bits kind of get lost in the dull. Or the nonsensical, or just the choppiness of it. So yeah, story... <sighs> story gets a two as well. Not enough to make me mad, but definitely not enough to make me care. Look and feel. Well, this is gonna be quick. This movie costs 25 million to make, okay? Which is 15 million dollars more than the first one, and yet the first one looks about 15 million dollars better than this one. Don't know what happened or how, but they managed to lose their polish. There's a jewel versus rock analogy here somewhere, but I really can't be bothered trying to string it together. They get some very nice scenics, they get some very nice setup shots. The cinematography isn't that bad, I suppose. I mean, really. You're never wondering where they are. It always looks like what it's meant to look like, but that's about it. And the only real action set piece that actually stands out and is memorable in any way, running away from the guards as they're escaping, they climb into an F-15 or an F-16 fighter, and they fire it up and off they go. Now, no one knows how to fly the thing, so they're just driving it around with a big jet engine in the back. So that's kind of cool, machine guns going off, rockets firing, chaos and mayhem, buildings getting smashed, bits falling off the aircraft, and they escape the city walls and go tearing down the highway with everyone chasing them. Visually, it's a fairly unique scenario. It was kind of nifty. And pretty much the highlight of the movie, the only actual highlight of the movie. And despite that, it still felt cheap. Just some of the connecting shots just don't work. And this strange mishmash of static mid to long shots, and then a really cool kind of action cam and dynamic angle sort of thing, and then back to literally some dude standing in the street watching a car go by. It was just weird. For all the money spent and the location shots and the clear amount of effort that went into this film, it just doesn't look or feel impressive. It's a typical, forgettable, generic action movie look. Which means it also gets a two. Now they'll just stop before I start repeating myself. Script and dialogue, well it continues the trend. Delivery isn't always a problem, although it occasionally is what they have to say. Again, not usually the problem, but occasionally it's pretty clunky. I think it's honestly the editing. It really honestly feels like about three or four different scripts all mushed together here. Because you'll have you'll have characters going in a direction, then severely change, then change back, and then change again. Like like the romance angle that I told you before. The amount of times I couldn't figure out what they were doing. And Ralph, he's enemy ally, enemy ally. And that's okay, that sort of character is meant to be sort of like that. But some of the changes are abrupt. He's literally been captured, threatened with death several times by the tribesmen. They're dragging him along and they're going to kill him. He's got a rope around his neck and he's marching in front of horses, right? Next time you see him, he's sitting around a campfire and they're saying, Do you want to be one of us? If you want to be one of us, join us in this ritual and you'll become one of us. And he becomes one of them. They give him a turban and a cape and a camel and a sword and all this sort of stuff. Like... There was no in-between. He was captive and now brother. Once again, the things I want to know about don't happen on screen. And I want to know what that is because I swear I'd be more interested in the dull, dried out, flipping relationship dramas the other two are having. I mean, Turner and Douglas put everything into their lines. You can see that they're actually trying to make something what they've got. And DeVito does the same. But you'll have one conversation that feels like about nine takes all cut up and stitched back together again. Yes, I know. That's what they do in movies. They always do that in movies. I'm well aware of that. However, it's not always this obvious. There's the problem. The illusion doesn't work when you can see the strings. And we'll quickly talk about the fight scene choreograph which is generally terrible. It's got some of the most lackluster sword fights happening in the background that you'll ever see. You see these two here? These two. When the camera pans past them, the big final finale, those two look like they're practicing their moves in slow motion for the actual filming. During the final fight, there's this constant woman screaming somewhere. 
And then something else happened and you hear that scream again. And then again. That alone was bizarre. But in none of the shots did you see a woman in the crowd. No women there. None. That's the sort of thing you notice when the grand finale is nowhere near as interesting as a major action set piece that happened in the middle of the movie. Script and dialogue. While it wasn't inherently bad, it was very poorly put together or out of sequence or just felt strange. So yeah, it also gets a two. Fun factor. Nah. Nah. Not really. I was bored. I was glad when it was over. If it wasn't for that one good sequence and this morbid fascination as to see how it turns out, I would have just stopped it. That and I kind of feel obliged to give a full review. So the score for Fun Factor manages to drop below an already poor average. It gets a 1.75. It's really just a waste of my time. Final score time. Well, you add them all together and you get yourself a 9.75. Ta-da! We've dropped below a 10. On the whole, this movie felt unnecessary. It added nothing to the existing storyline. Apparently there was a third in the works, something called the Crimson Eagle, where they're going to end up in Thailand with their two teenage kids. It'd be hard to do worse, I suppose, but you know. Anyway, would I recommend this? No. No, just stick with the first one. If you enjoyed the first one, stay with the first one. Honestly, this adds nothing. If you feel like being a completionist and watching it anyway, cool, that's on you. I did warn you. If I had a final word to say about it, I would call this a classic textbook example of sequelitis. That's my review of the movie. I hope you enjoyed it, and I am sorry if I'm just going to trample across one of your favourites. Please comment down below or on the Facebook page, like, share, and subscribe. But as usual, I hope you're having a great week, and that you find some time to go watch a movie.